Welcome to Kuwait's Industrial Automation and Control Systems Cybersecurity Conference, KIAX Cybersecurity 2014, 25 through 26 May 2014. Hosted and organized by Equate Petrochemical Company in partnership with KPC. Um, and this is going to be conducted by Sinclair Coulomé, who is the technical lead for Europe, Middle East and Africa at Honeywell Industrial IT Solutions. Today he's going to be doing a speech entitled How to Protect an ICS Against a Determined Attacker. And Sinclair, with over 35 years in control systems, has an extensive expertise in cyber security for industrial control systems. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Sinclair Coulomé. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, let me not get in your way. Uh, pick up this thing. I'm. Uh, be that guy, but I was already introduced, so I will not spend much time on that. I uh, worked 35 years for Honeywell, but not always 35 years in security, because when I started out, actually security was not a really subject uh, in the 1980s. Uh, I started out also a system programmer, so probably also created some security vulnerabilities in those time, which were never exploited because no one tried. But I, my subject is going to be about what is required to protect an ICS system. And that can change. If you have a, a cheese factory in the Netherlands, that's a different security level than if you have a nuclear facility in any other country. So there are differences of uh, security necessary, and my story is about how to determine uh, that level of security. I do that with some statements, and I like to emphasize some of the words in that. Basically, a security attack, cyber attack, is that a threat exploits some vulnerability that causes some damage to the industrial control system, ICS, which raises the risk for the production system itself for the, for the business. Two words I like to look at in particular. I talk about exposed vulnerability. So if I talk about protection, I have two options. I can do something about the vulnerability or I can do something about the exposure, the accessibility of that vulnerability toward the attacker. But I know both are very important because sometimes I cannot take away the vulnerability. It would be nice to take away the vulnerability with a security patch or replacing something, but that's not always possible. Uh, I cannot also not always take away the exposure. Uh, so sometimes I have to reduce the exposure. And then it becomes more interesting because then we talk about risk and how much exposure I should reduce. Another thing I would like to talk about is ICS. ICS is not only information, it's not only information security, like it is in generally in IT uh, security, we talk about information security, but it's also about functions, functions of the control system that act, perform actions that are time dependent, that are real time dependent. So I can disturb an ICS also by disturbing this real time behavior of a system. And finally, I put controls in place to reduce that increased risk. <clears throat> if we talk about uh, security levels, protection levels of a plant, I say 99 created basically four levels. Uh, in some of the documents that talk about security assurance levels, in later documents, later releases, they talked about security levels. But basically, it's the same here. And ISA 99 looks at the capabilities of the attacker you're trying to keep out. You have casual attacks or casual causes that would be 
more or less if you have uh, given your own employees too much privileges. If a process operator would be able to do everything in a, in a system, he could cause all kinds of problems. And that would be more or less casual things, not deliberate attacks, so accidental things happening. The other uh, levels are all deliberate attacks. Some of them targeted, if I talk about uh, it's targeted to the ICS specific environment. We talk about the uh, levels three and four, and some of them generic. <coughs> Let me move to an example. If we take the Shamoon attack that was, uh, I think almost two years ago, August 2012, happening, I would say, personally, I would say that is in security level two type of attack. Because it wasn't ICS specific, it wasn't actually also very sophisticated. If you analyze the software, okay, it did a lot of damage, but uh, it was not rocket science to create it. On the other end, if you look at Stuxnet, that was very, very complicated, very uh, in-depth uh, type of, uh, knowledge required, it actually uh, anticipated on the ladder logic of the PLC. So you, had, you needed to know everything of that site to attack it. <coughs> so you can have security levels. And these security levels in ISA 99, if you would have selected a particular security level, they determine the security requirements. There is a standard, the 62443, dot three dot three standard, one of the several documents of the ISA 99 standard that defines for each security level which requirements apply. And those, when you know the requirements, you can translate that into your uh, security controls, into your countermeasures, into actually uh, things to do. And if I talk about controls, I'm not talking only about technical controls, but also about the non-technical controls, the procedures, the policies. And this is uh, still going on, these attacks. This is one of the latest in April. Uh, so less than a month ago, hackers attacked an oil rig and they modified the balancing uh, of that rig to keep it uh, uh, balanced and they tilted it by that. So that, that thing going on and this was an, uh, another targeted attack, very specific on that, uh, in that situation, and uh, uh, well, you, need, you really needed to know what to do. Last concept, before I start talking about the real uh, content of my subject, is control effectiveness. What I see is we implement a lot of controls. Uh, in my world, where I work, I do uh, many, many assessments, I've done more than assessments for more than 100 plants globally. Uh, so my customers are generally very aware, otherwise they wouldn't have hired us. Uh, we do mitigation projects. But what I often see is that controls implemented are not always effective. Sometimes they're very good uh, controls, but they're missing a lot of, uh, yeah, uh, security value in the sense that they do not protect against a particular threat or they leave open uh, lots of other uh, possibilities. And that's uh, what we call control effectiveness. And control effectiveness is created by two uh, elements. It's created by design effectiveness. So what kind of controls do you have implemented, both in the technical sense as in the operational sense, but also how do you execute your processes that we call operational effectiveness. And theoretically, control effectiveness is the product of the two. So you get this nice matrix. And with security assessments, you determine basically where a plant is and which, uh, what is the control effectiveness of a, of a plant. And with risk assessments, you determine where it should be. And then you have your mitigation part between the two. And that's basically the uh, statement or the, the story I'm going to tell from the next slides onward. 
With one last remark on this is that it is a continuous process. It's, it's something which never ends. Some people hope or think that they spend money on securing a system and then the system is secure. Unfortunately, that's not the case because the environment is continuously changing. Security is wearing in a certain way that uh, uh, is not effective anymore in, in particular situations. So then uh, you'll be continuously working on this. Cyber risk change constantly and you cannot reduce it to zero. So there's always risk. That's basically also, if you, they say if you want to do business, you have to take risk. So you cannot reduce risk to zero. If you reduce risk to zero, you have to stop doing business. Okay, this is uh, actually the first slide I like to uh, talk a little bit longer about. Security for me is two parts. You have the daily job of keeping systems secure. The bottom side, that's more or less the IT side. And the top side is the decision side where you create your decisions on what to do on how to protect your system. And basically that has to do with risk. I uh, go into more detail through this uh, picture. <coughs> we have, uh, first, we need to identify risk. We need to know what the risk is. And that changes. For each company, that's different. Or for each industry, it's different. But can also differ for companies within the industry because it depends on things like the risk factors. The risk factors can change side by side, can be influenced by the topology of your system, and can be influenced uh, by the the location of your, your system, the political environment of your system. There are many reasons why risk varies for different companies. But when you have your risk, the next thing what you need to do is make a decision on how to control it. And then there are many ways to do it. You can, of course, try to avoid risk by not doing a particular thing. Yeah, there are customers of us that really do not want to connect uh, their control system to the corporate network, so they avoid the risk of exchanging data on an automated way. That's a way of protection. Uh, but okay, they also miss an opportunity at that moment by having to find other ways of communication, maybe manual ways. In, in my early days within Honeywell, if I came into a control room, you had a big line printer there which printed out reports and every day someone came in that control room, picked up the box with paper, moved it to the office and there were other people typing it in. That's of course also risk because people can type in wrong numbers and there can go a lot of things wrong with the paper even. You know, line printers could fail and there were a lot of risk also in that situation. Uh, but there's another way of uh, communicating. So you can, you need some response. And that response ultimately, first it translates theoretically in what we call controls, risk controls, reducing the risk. And that can be translated into technical controls, things like firewalls, things like antivirus, things like whitelisting, IPS, well you can call a very long range of uh, applications and equipment to do the technical task. You have non-technical controls, the policies that say the limits of what you allow, the procedures, all those uh, uh, things, control forms, they create basically the uh, non-technical. And not to forget, because sometimes this, this right box is not included, but environment of an industrial control system is also very important. Specifically in, in this region, with very high temperatures, if you lose in specific areas in your plant, you lose your airco, well, a lot of the switches are not capable of going into high temperatures. So systems might fail if the uh, temperature is not good. 
Of course, power is another one, physical security. So you also have to control, apart from the industrial control system, the environment of the industrial control system to keep it secure. On the top, you have the decision engine. Well, who is the owner of risk? Generally, that would be the business. And if you go to a bank and you ask who is the owner of risk, they would say the business is the owner of risk, not the IT department. The IT department is taking care of the execution, the daily, the implementation, and the maintenance of all these security controls. What do we see when we do security assessments and risk assessments? Very often in our world, people in this little box active in the technical controls, they take, they make risk decisions where plan management is not even aware of. And they, they, I have customers and I have seen sites where uh, engineers determined I will not run antivirus because antivirus is loading my system too much. Then he takes a risk and we're not always aware if the plan manager agrees with taking that risk. So in an organization, there is, should be a, decision, a, a, a division between those guys who take risk or decide on risk response, say senior management, the business, and those guys who actually take care of the daily uh, security. And that is IT or uh, the, the process IT people. <coughs> and we talk about uh, risk, then how do you determine risk? Well, first of all, very important statement here is that if you want to do business, risk is required, otherwise there will not be opportunity. So if you want to, to exchange your information between your control system and your corporate systems, then you take risk. But of course the benefit is that easy exchange of information, correct information, uh, and lower cost of, uh, of exchange. So that is the risk required to do business. There's a risk required to make your business more competitive than someone who is doing it in different ways. Uh, very important is also the risk you can afford. Some risk you just cannot afford. If it is risk, coming back to safety, you cannot afford that. Human life in our culture is very important, so there's nothing going above that. There might be all kinds of licenses of operation restricting the risk you take. Uh, for example, in the Netherlands where I live, I've worked uh, several years on a refinery, and there you're allowed a certain amount of hours, you can, you're allowed to run without your safety system. After that, you have to shut down the plant. So there's a small time period that you can cover uh, with a failing safety system or upgrading a safety system, that type of uh, activity. You can never go over that. So if that is set to four hours, then that is four hours. But there's also some risk you feel comfortable with. If I would have to upgrade that safety system, and I would tell the plant manager, okay, I can do that in one hour, and I can even recover if it doesn't work in an extra half an hour, so it takes me one half an hour to do that, then maybe the plant manager says, okay, that's all right. But if I would say, tell him the same story, and would tell him, okay, I need three hours to do the upgrade, and it takes me at least 45 minutes to recover if it doesn't work, then he might not feel very comfortable. And then he might say, no, I don't want to take that risk. You do that in the next plant stop and not in the, while I'm producing. So there is a, uh, a level you feel comfortable with. The technical terminology of that is your risk appetite, which is determined by the business. That should not be determined by the IT. There is a risk you cannot afford, which is technically your risk tolerance. So that's kind of a limit or a band around your risk appetite. And you have to design your system generally on not 
passing this risk you cannot afford. So you, your risk should always be lower than your risk tolerance. In reality, what we do is that the residual risk in the system should always be the same as your risk appetite. And that's basically what you do to, during uh, uh, designing a secure system. Well, now, there are multiple ways of doing this. There is an easy way. That's uh, on the left, compliance to a standard. Compliance to a standard will tell you exactly what to do. Now, other people have taken into account what risks you are taking. If you, you take ISA 99 and you select security level two, you get a lot of requirements and you can translate these requirements into uh, actual controls but that doesn't necessarily meet your own risk appetite. And there might be differences for your industry, there might be differences in your uh, risk factors in your plant. So that's the easy way. When I started uh, working with risk analysis, that was about 2006, a couple of big companies in Western Europe were starting cybersecurity, and the first thing they were doing was okay, we, cybersecurity has something to do with risk. So they started talking about risk has to do something with my business process, so I have to find out how security impacts my business progress. Well, I've been involved myself as a, as a consultant on the technical side in two of these projects, for very big, major uh, oil companies in this case. And both projects more or less failed because it's very hard to determine risk based upon very little information. We, we are just missing information in our business to come to very de determined conclusions. And so you, you have, uh, well, you have a challenge there and the, and the result is not very uh, helpful, very subjective or, uh, very often. Then, a couple of years ago, a new uh, methodology started to be used, and that's cyber failure scenario, where in risk analysis, you look at business objectives, at business uh, uh, impact. In cyber failure scenarios, you look more technology. So you pick up a particular application, and you analyze that. It's more like threat modeling than it is uh, full risk analysis like you would do in the uh, traditional uh, environment. Well, uh, I give you here an example of, for example, an asset management uh, system. And also an example of what we see very often uh, being forgotten. If you have an asset management system and they're increasingly used, Nowadays, very often they're used with a multiplexer, and the multiplexer they connect various uh, uh, field instruments to, and you manage that centrally from a server. Uh, how could I attack that? I could, of course, attack that management server, and I could uh, maybe modify the database. So the next time you, you download the information to the transmitters, it would be different than you would expect. That would be a potential attack. I could try to attack it over the network communication or otherwise communication because frequently these packages use clear text communication. So I could try to uh, have some attack, maybe men in the middle attack uh, through AFP spoofing or there are multiple ways of, of trying to do that and modifying it. Uh, that would be a pot possibility. A third possibility would be I don't look at all at the, the uh, server of the management system. I don't look at the communication. I go straight to the transmitter. If you have in this example here on the right side, you for example have a safety PLC, a safety controller. Normally on a safety controller, you have a key lock. And the key lock prevents you overriding the logic of that safety uh, device. And it's very important to have that key lock because then you at least have something physically necessary to turn before someone 
can change that logic. If I have this configuration and I have uh, transmitters which have no override protection, then of course can also modify the range, for example, with a proper attack in that transmitter, which would impact my logic in my safety controller because suddenly I have a different trigger point where I, uh, uh, well, what, what, what would trigger my, my safety activity. So it's very important uh, to have this type of overview. And the nice thing about cyber failure scenarios, which is a library of a lot of uh, uh, applications, uh, we have at this moment almost in our database almost 60 scenarios of different uh, type of equipment, different applications, different technology. But the nice thing about this is that you can very focusedly analyze uh, this yeah, the, 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 the threats and the uh, possible ways to protect that, to anticipate on that threat. Of course, there is also a disadvantage because uh, the sum of all these, these systems is, yeah, the sum of the components is not necessarily the same as the system. So there can be overlap, can be all kinds of interactions that you have to take care of. But it makes analysis, it makes risk analysis much more uh, manageable than looking at it from a total uh, system perspective. In uh, that type of analysis, what you generally do is you have on one end, you have your risk, and on the other end, you have the controls, how you anticipate to the risk and then you can easily see what is the residual risk of the, the two, of the, basically the, the subtraction of the two. So on the left, I have ineffective threat miti mitigation, which would be a kind of a key risk indicator for this. I have a number of uh, ways I can mitigate threats by doing security patches, by malware protection, by intrusion protection. I can measure, of course, how well is that organized and what are the problems in that. I can provide values for design effectiveness. I can provide values for operational effectiveness of those controls. And then I know the control effectiveness. And on the left side, you have basically the uh, impact and the uh, likelihood that determine the risk or the severity. The S here stands for severity, but very often uh, it's the R of risk, which is basically the same. But a risk register is uh, part of this cyber failure scenario, and it lists for each type of threat what the controls are. So you also very quickly see the residual risk, because certain controls you haven't implemented, then you have some more residual risk in other situations and it's connected to these security levels. Uh, well, once we have the risk, we have the controls, we do the daily work, and I'm not really going to talk in, uh, in the 30 minutes about this area, <coughs> but this is actually, if you look at majority of uh, discussions today, everyone talks in this bottom part of the system. They talk about the technical controls, they want to implement all kind of nice uh, security applications, but in reality, most people will get the top. They do are not aware of what risks there are. They're not always aware of what risks they seem to have accepted. While if you split the two, which some companies are doing nowadays, there are a couple of companies, not many, but a couple of companies who are actually reorganizing this and bringing this uh, cyber risk management into as part of enterprise risk management. So the integrates there, the, the, the risk officer becomes more or less responsible for that process, while the senior management is responsible for this, uh, well, the risk level itself. What's the risk appetite? <coughs> okay, I'll skip this one so that I can go immediately to the last slide and explain the previous slide in here. 
I think you have seen this because I've seen presentations, I believe Siemens showed not this picture, but the same uh, steps, but identifying risk, framing risk, protect, detect, respond, recover. What's very important in security is that you have balance in your security, and also that is often a challenge here. A lot of security people, a lot of companies are focusing on the protection. They try to build the wall as high as possible, but that doesn't help. If you build a wall high and thick, that okay, that stops the enemy a little bit, but you sooner or later have to put some card on top of the wall that can see the army coming and can see what kind of activities the attacker is doing, how big his ladder is, how long his ladder is, and how strong his cannons are. So you need also detection. And detection is not enough because if you have detect, you also need to do something. And what I see, for example, is that a lot of our clients have antivirus. That would be protection. But very few of our customers have arranged response to when they find a, fi a virus. And then they start calling and they say, uh, well, we have a virus, what to do now? Well, to do that properly, we, uh, you need to, uh, to prepare that. And you need to have tools ready to assist you in recovering and repairing. Okay, my final word here, because I have my timeout uh, sign. <laughs> recover, sometimes you lose the battle, and then you need to recover. I mean, uh, something like what happened to, to Aramco and Raskas, uh, that was a major effort recovering, a major effort getting hard disk, major effort cleaning things, uh, and that also takes organization. Okay, thank you very much. Hosted and organized by Equate Petrochemical Company in partnership with KPC.